Thank you everyone for joining us today. My name is Matthew Bremen. I'm the Global Director for the YEO 2030 Initiative. Making Sense is excited to have YEO 2030's global partner Palladium, a leader in the YEO space with areas of expertise that include economic growth and education and workforce development. And in this, which is the last of five lead YEO 2030 solution sessions. To provide you a little bit of um, context for these solution sessions, since 2007, Making Sense has been convening the Global Youth Economic Opportunities Summit to share learning, develop partnerships, and advance economic opportunities for youth. The inequities that COVID and social justice movements have exposed have increased the need to accelerate change, particularly for young people. It's become a turning point for the GYEO Summit agenda. So we're transforming our approach to fully include young people alongside adults in our activities, ensuring that youth are co-designing solutions to their own problems, not just serving as, as window dressing as such on, on panels. So in addition, we're going to be expanding the dialogue beyond Washington, D.C., beyond the U.S., and seek to host or support convenings around the world that will engage youth and adults locally to discuss, discuss solutions to SDG 8 that are relevant in their context. Now, during 21-22, you'll see on the slide, we're doing this through a series of events you see listed, um, youth dialogues, YEO solution sessions or webinars on key topics of interest to young people and convenings, regional global convenings comprising a, a series of near-term activities that are designed to share the latest YEO program lessons and to gain commitment from actors globally to advance good practices within a common language and framework of the SDGs, specifically for achievement of, of um, SDG 8, which is, as many of you know, to promote sustained, inclusive and sustainable economic growth, full and productive employment and decent work for all. We're also planning to establish global convenings as annual touch points to track progress toward achievement of SDG. So that's all to come. Um, I want to also uh, mention our partners. As you'll see on the slide, thank you to all of our partners for both financial and in-kind contributions as we embark on this exciting new initiative. I specifically want to recognize our, our partner Palladium today, um, our global session partner, along with FHI 360 and CRS, we're regional session partners. I want to acknowledge our first two local partners, Africa Skills Hub, you'll see here in the Latin American Leadership Academy, LALA. Their organization is joining every day, so please let us know if you're interested in committing to YEO 2030. Um, today, we are excited to hear about three models or solutions to youth workforce financing um, within three different country contexts. So, I want to pass it over um, without further ado to, um, to Katie. I want to welcome Katie Vicklin, who's Palladium's Director of Youth and Workforce Development, to get us started. Over to you, Katie. Thank you so much, Matthew. On behalf of Palladium, thank you, each of you, for joining us today. I'm Katie Vicklin, the Director of Youth and Workforce at Palladium. I want to thank Making Sense for this opportunity to engage with each of you, our peers, our colleagues, youth, business, governments who are tackling perhaps the most amazing and difficult challenge that we face today in development, which is youth workforce development. We need to transform local market systems to be efficient. We need to ensure sufficient resources to support training and placement of youth for uh, demand-led um, jobs, decent jobs. So as you can see on slide five, we're going to highlight the critical need for innovative workforce financing. In order for us to together reach SDG 8, we've got to have better local systems. They've got people need the relationships across business and training institutions, across youth serving and youth led organizations with training institutions, the government and business and business associations in order to have those relationships, incentives, information, capacity to create transformative market systems. Those systems need resources. USAID has been a uh, loyal and diligent partner in supporting demand-led workforce development around the world. Governments support it every day. Business sometimes steps up and families um, and youth um, do their part as well. And yet there's a financing gap. We've been addressing that in innovative ways across three countries and we look forward to sharing that with you today. As slide six shows, you'll have a chance today to hear from three panels. 
with three evidence, evidence-based models from our work in Ecuador, Ethiopia, and Rwanda. But I wanna begin by sharing with you a systems framework for the models. Slide seven summarizes Palladium's transformational market systems approaches for workforce development. Now it's a busy slide, but um, I wanted to incorporate a number of complex ideas, all of which are important. So let me just unpack three key insights from this slide. First of all, what is our goal? Let's start in the center with the overarching goal of facilitating inclusive and shared value solutions to inefficient market systems. That's in the center of the slide. We must harness limited USAID funds to facilitate the local capacity for tailored solutions to the root causes of inefficient market systems. A second key outcome from this market systems approach is that the value of enhanced workforce programming is shared broadly. You see this at the top of the slide where we list the outcomes of good workforce programs. There's economic outcomes, social outcomes, and systemic outcomes. So some of the economic outcomes, of course, are jobs and incomes. Some of the social incomes are equity. And the systemic incomes include training institutions with business-led training and placement approaches that attract students and revenue, thus developing viable business models for sustainability and growth. So it's the breadth of these outcomes that perhaps counterintuitively contributes to underinvestment in workforce development, the topic we're tackling today. After all, students and their families have a strong incentive to invest in workforce training, but they often have limited means. Businesses invest, but they have a limited understanding of the benefits of workforce development. And um, they don't always speak the same language as academia. I would argue they rarely do. Um, there's lots of potential funders receiving significant benefits, but partial benefits. So how can we activate them? How can we embolden them? So let's turn to our third insight from a market systems approach. And that is that successful workforce initiatives harness, empower, train, and support the enablers across the bottom of your slide. So that's the businesses, the financial resources, the training providers, the governments, youth, and digital infrastructure. How do we facilitate lasting solutions among these critical stakeholders, champions, and potential leaders? So transformational approaches in our global experience over 50 years address one or more of four key subsystems of, the, of a functioning market systems. And those are labeled initiatives. And you'll see them on this slide, business systems, training systems, finance systems, and policy systems. So let's get specific about what works in developing the local capacity to provide demand-led training sustainably for years and decades going forward. So a first sustainable approach to innovative finance for private sector-led opportunity creation and economic empowerment is the Alliance for Entrepreneurship and Innovation, AEI, which Palladium developed in Ecuador and you'll hear from in a moment. This model facilitates development of dynamic business systems to catalyze opportunities. Now this is in red on the initiatives row, business systems. Specifically, AEI engages business leaders to improve the supply chains, improve their outreach to small businesses, which can employ youth and invest in them and mentor them for significant success. So the Ecuadorian legacy organization, AEI, has its roots in the USAID Productive Network Program. This was implemented by Palladium and ended some seven years ago. And yet AEI, as you will hear, is thriving and growing and supporting growth across Ecuador and has grown to other countries. So Productive Network 
had as its goal strengthening development organizations in Ecuador, supporting organizations to fill key gaps in the nation's spectrum of financing opportunities. Productive Network engaged in public-private dialogue, facilitated technical assistance, brought in best practices from our global programming. It served the function of honest broker, bringing together important actors to co-create a new entity to catalyze entrepreneurship and innovation. AEI was launched just before Productive Network ended, and AEI Panama opened in 2019, further demonstrating sustainability without USAID funding. A second sustainable model that you're going to hear about today is to focus on enhancing training systems ability to engage with employers and train and place youth in high priority occupations. This model is depicted in blue on the initiatives line, training systems. So you'll hear in this second case study about USAID's Catalyze Ethiopia Market Systems for Growth team. Lydia and her team are catalyzing viable business models for workforce services groups. USAID catalyzes new investment into business-led training and placement by working with the training providers, including non-traditional training providers such as startups, business associations, consulting firms. We provide pay-for-performance contracts with facilitate groups to consult with employers, develop demand-driven training, and place youth through a viable business model. You'll hear from an Ethiopian training institution, employer, and new employee, how MS4G improves businesses and their processes with well-trained personnel. The third model we will introduce today, um, some of you have um, had some access with before, and we're really excited to provide an important update on stimulating better workforce systems outcomes by supporting innovation in financial products. This is in orange on your initiatives line of the market systems. And these innovation financing spread the risk and de-risk the education financing so students can enter training programs that lead to jobs. Finance programs such as USAID's Catalyze Education Finance Program are promoting private sector investment to supplement existing local government and student and family expenditures on education, fill that much needed financing gap. So in our third case study, you'll hear how Chanson is providing what student Mary Grace deems life-saving educational financing. And you'll hear directly from the government of Rwanda how the income sharing agreement contributes to their plans to compile and disseminate information on job placement rates across higher education institutions. This information helps students and their families make important decisions about where to study and what to study. It epitomizes the systemic impact of thoughtfully designed workforce programs. The fourth system on the initiatives line is policy systems, and it is integrated in a cross-cutting manner across all the activities, although we won't emphasize it today due to time constraints. My colleague, Rebecca Barbary, manager of Palladium's Youth and Workforce Portfolio, will introduce the first case study. Thank you, Katie. I'm excited to introduce our first model, the Alliance for Entrepreneurship and Innovation, or AEI. Executive Director Camilo Penzone will walk us through AEI's trust financing model, and then we'll hear a panel discussion with AEI's deputy director, an entrepreneur supported by AEI, and a mentor who provided support to entrepreneurs. We encourage you to type your questions in the chat box and to join the Alliance for Entrepreneurship breakout room at the end of the session to speak with AEI representatives directly. Thanks. Hi everyone, my name is Camilo Pinzon. I'm the chairman of the board of AEI. That means that it's the Alliance for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. We have, um, we're working in, in Ecuador. We were born in Ecuador, but now we also work in Panama and we, have, we collaborate with different countries in Latin America. We want entrepreneurship and innovation uh, to believe in it, uh, to create, opportunities and help organizations to grow around this ecosystem. AI is mainly an ecosystem, a network that has uh, different institutions that are partnering with us. Institutions from 
uh, private sector, from public sector, from academy, from international organizations and multilateral organizations around the world. But what is the thing or the belief that makes everyone to work together? And it's a massive transformation purpose, it's our dream to come true in the future. And we believe that empower entrepreneurship and innovation is the way to build a better world. That's why we are working so hard in all the things that we do. As you can see there, you can see here a lot of logos uh, from different companies. These in, in private sector, there are very important companies from different sectors, from retail, from uh, um, agriculture, from technology and uh, business school, universities, uh, food industry, and a lot of things more. And this is a network that is working together with the same goals to make things happen. We are like a, a honest broker. We, in, the, in, the, in these years, this organization uh, trusts in us to build and to make power, uh, problem, to, to build projects in corporations to uh, empower entrepreneurship and innovation. You can see there. And I will focus on our business model because we have different things that we do. But one of the special fields is to strong the ecosystem for financing entrepreneurship and, and innovation in the country. And how we do that? The first thing that we do, we identify a problem. We have different problems and then different ways to finance them. It's not only to give them access to credit or give them access to different uh, financial institutions. There are other problems that are affecting this. Then, for example, when we had the earthquake in Ecuador, we saw that the small business um that all them fall down because of the earthquake they were not able to receive uh, a credit to rebuild their their business what we do what we did is to provide investment capital for the purpose of instrument we have investors that identify and want to invest in that solution after that we put that uh, investment in a trust board then we receive investor contributions we have uh, we manage resources we contract an operator that make things happen and to guarantee transparency and good management all around the uh, process and we also receive the dividends and we try to uninvest and prioritizing initial owners the contract and the operator obviously has a due diligence, uh, help us to do consulting, and we are auditing every, everything that we do. But not only that, we also invest in risk capital business. We are in the network, we have different organizations that are building the risk capital in the country. We are not directly investing in them but we are strengthening the ecosystem for make this happen this is very important because with all this we have two kinds of uh, entrepreneurs that we have impacted social entrepreneurship we can now count around 8000 beneficiaries more than 3.5 million us dollars in sales increase and the most important thing we have around 172 uh, increase in average in household income. You can, uh, you, maybe you can think this is not too much, but for them is like doubling, it's, it's double of the income they used to have. That's really a huge impact in what we did. And the second one is the innovative entrepreneurship. We have around 7,000 beneficiaries around the, from uh, 2013 to 2020. And we saw in them there are very small businesses uh, that 
came from nothing. Now 36 million in sales increase, 9 million in sports, and a lot of risk capital that came uh, around 40 million that came to finance this growth in these companies. You can see the photo of the beneficiaries there, and we are very happy of the impact we're having. We, we can do that because we work as a network, we believe in our, in our in, in, in the things that we're doing, and we think that this financial model that we adapt to every problem is having an impact in the country in different fields. Thank you very, thank you very much. If you want to know more about AI, we will be happy to join you. Thank you so much, Camilo, for that exciting introduction to the Alliance for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. To dive deeper into how AEI works, I'm joined by three expert panelists, each who bring unique perspectives and experiences working with AEI. I'm excited to introduce and welcome Natalia Almeida. Natalia is the Deputy Director of AEI, where she leads strategic planning and policy advocacy. We're also joined by Diego Vergara, who has served as both an ally and mentor to entrepreneurs supported by AEI. And finally, Guillermo Harin, the founder and CEO of TPT and an entrepreneur supported by AEI's financial ecosystem. Welcome to each of you. To, tar to start our discussion and to build on what Camilo already shared, it'd be great to hear from you, Natalia, about what you think makes the trust financing model used by AEI financially sustainable. Hi, Rebecca. Thank you so much for this opportunity to share about AEI on this platform where people from all around can hear about our experience from Ecuador. AI's finance model has allowed us to bring opportunities to more than 14,000 entrepreneurs so far. And they all come from uh, different parts of the country. And the main two outcomes are to increase sales and create uh, employment. Our model is based in two different sources. One of them it's from our network of more than 140 allies. Since 2013, we have developed a network of multiple actors from private, public, and academic institutions whose common purpose is to promote entrepreneurship and innovation in the country. These more than 100 actors work together with clear goals and concrete collaborative actions in short, medium, and long term. These all different actions are set up in our strategic agenda and we all commit to work together toward these common goals. The second is um, we create different projects with allies and other actors as well that are interested in solving real problems in our country. For example, we had an earthquake in 2016 or after the COVID pandemic we created different projects with uh, these different actors commit with resources in different programs, um, for example, funds or technical assistance or commercial opportunities, or also as mentorship hours. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Natalia. So moving to Diego, can you describe how you supported entrepreneurs as a mentor? What kind of support do AEI mentors provide? Uh, sure. Uh, thank you for the invitation, Rebecca. Uh, well, regarding my personal case, uh, my first involvement as mentor began with the creation of the first entrepreneurship impact investment fund that was promoted by the Alliance, where I was one of the investors, but also act as technical operator of this fund. So that brought a lot of opportunities to me for mentorship these entrepreneurs. And my participation as mentor through the Impact Fund included the due diligence of several investment opportunities in startups where I had to evaluate persons, the entrepreneurs, their business models, the challenges to promote their growth. And that involves working with them in their business valuation, uh, give a lot of advice and negotiations for investments and, and follow the implementation plans for those companies where the fund finally invested. No? So then those companies uh, where the investment was made, I became a, an active mentor and part of the strategic partners in their board. So my support mainly included the help in management of those companies to achieve the objectives of their business plans, the support in product innovation, 
the connection to potential market opportunities, including local and international buyers, and any additional support that we could bring from the Alliance network. No? And regarding the, the mentor support, well, uh, when you're running a startup, you can think of a whole world of needs that you have to fulfill. And usually you need some type of guidance. So the AI mentors program provides a wide range of services by connecting uh, entrepreneurs to, to the network. They are exposed to expert support in several areas, including access to finance, uh, access, access to sectorial expertise, access to companies that are acting as anchor firms and are willing to support the startup access to markets. And we also take advantage of the international work uh, network of the AEI to connect uh, uh, these startups to international markets. Great. Thank you so much, Diego. I can really see how the guidance and market linkages from mentors both help entrepreneurs grow and expand their businesses, but also helps ensure the financial sustainability of AEI's trust financing model by nurturing the network's investments. I'm now really excited to hear about the AEI experience from an entrepreneur themselves. Guillermo, how did AEI support TPT, and what do you see as some of the key elements of success that led to the growth of TPT? Hi, Rebecca. Thank you for this invitation. We have worked with AEI since we started with TPT. Uh, thanks to the network, we have achieved uh, market access to supermarkets, uh, financial credit for entrepreneurs, mentoring, angel uh, capital. Later, we achieved uh, venture capital too. And recently, we received support to export our products to Panama. Wow, that is so impressive. Congratulations on all the success of TPT. It's really um, powerful to see how you're both supported financially with different investments, but also um, those connections and linkages provided by mentors in the Alliance that you know, Diego described and then you were able to benefit from. Really exciting. So now back to Natalia. If other business leaders in other countries want to replicate the AEI model, what advice would you give them? I think the most important um, thing um, to start this is uh, joining forces with different sectors with a, and define a long-term vision with them. Um, it has to be a collaborative and very clear plan on what they want to do together. And they have to, to have a purpose that it's bigger than their own. So they all connect with uh, this uh, action plan that they want to bring to the world, to, the, to their own country. And then also they need to have and feel value added to what they are doing. So they keep on working together. Great, thank you. And Diego, can you share why you decided to serve as a mentor for entrepreneurs and any advice you'd give to others considering serving as a mentor themselves? Sure, uh, as I mentioned previously, uh, mentoring was part of the process of our investment fund. However, this has helped me in my personal and professional growth a lot. You know? So I really feel that, that helping an entrepreneur brings me a lot of personal satisfaction, uh, as well as it updates my knowledge, challenges my, uh, my, my intervention in the current market ecosystem and the opportunities that it brings, but also allows me to, to be in contact with more than 150 members of the Alliance that enriches my own business network. You know? I can say that this mentorship uh, program brings me a great deal of creativity and innovation in the current business environment. And regarding the advice, well, the, the main advice that I can give someone that wants to become a mentor is, is to be honest in any business recommendation that is given to entrepreneurs, understanding their problems, and working, as Natalia said, in collaboration with the whole network. For me, that is one of the most important values of the AEI. Is to, is to use the whole knowledge of this alliance and put it at the service of the entrepreneurship ecosystem and help them grow. Thank you. And finally, Guillermo, I'm sure you have endless advice for young entrepreneurs around the world, um, but do you have a few words of advice on how best to find and take advantage of financing and mentorship opportunities like AEI? 
My advice is to try to work with the entire network uh, in the ecosystem. There are many opportunities of obtaining financing, mentoring, and access to market. If you are an, an entrepreneur, you must take advantage of all the opportunities that, the, that your network can offer you. Thank you so much, Guillermo. And I want to offer my most sincere thank you to all of our panelists today for sharing your invaluable insights and experiences related to AEI's innovative trust financing model. Thank you all so much. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Hello again. Um, this is Rebecca Barbary again. And um, if you want to have an opportunity to ask questions specifically to our AEI team, um, at the end of our three case studies, you can enter a breakout room, choosing between which of the three models you'd like to speak with and speak directly to the AEI team. Um, so stay on the line and, um, and, uh, and meet with them at the end. So next we'll move to the Market Systems for Growth program in Ethiopia. Lydia Argao, the Job Placement Advisor, will share how the program is empowering non-traditional training providers, followed by a discussion with Lydia about her recent conversations with partner B Singularity and a business and youth who have participated in the program's market systems approach. So as a reminder, feel free to type questions into the chat um, as Lydia is um, sharing her experience. Um, and once again, you will have the opportunity to go into a breakout room and speak with Lydia herself at the end of the session if you have specific questions about this model. So over to you, Lydia, to introduce the model. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, hi, everyone. This is Lydia Arga, Workforce Development Advisor from USAID Catalyze Market Systems for Growth Program in Ethiopia. Uh, it's really a pleasure to meet you all today. Uh, I would be explaining uh, or giving you a brief about uh, USAID Catalyze Market System for Growth uh, Workforce Development Approach. Uh, and then like Rebecca said, uh, we, I will try to address if there is any questions or comments that will be raised after the presentation. Um, so USAID Catalyze Market System for Growth program has uh, different components. Uh, we work on enterprise development, capital mobilization, and workforce development, which is one of our component. Uh, so I'm working on that uh, specific component. Uh, our approach in terms of workforce development is it's a market-based approach, uh, which focuses on Ethiopian youth and women uh, to gain a required skills, uh, which is needed or in demand from the private sector. Uh, in order to do this uh, and to better align and match workforce skills with uh, demand in the market or from the private sector. We use a, a pay for result approach. Uh, we call it P4R, P4R uh, or it's performance-based approach. We partner with several, several training centers, uh, placement centers through this approach. And every uh, partnership we will have will be based on their performance or the results they will be achieving. Uh, before going through the approach, maybe it would be good to share uh, to share um, our overall result chain, how we, we do our activities, and then how we accomplish the larger impact of uh, the workforce development within MS4G. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, one of the major activities we are currently doing or on our year one was uh, partnership with training in institutions or training in placement centers through the result-based or pay for result approach kind of contracts or agreements. Uh, through these agreements, we partner with uh, training and placement centers who have innovative ideas, innovative solutions, scalable solutions on use uh, job creation. Uh, so we will have uh, different modalities in order to partner with these uh, partners or training and placement uh, providers. In addition to this, uh, we have also established a user advisory board, which provides us Although we have a team of people who have experience on workforce development, uh, we have Palladium team who, who has been a great support in, uh, in doing our activities. We also engage with user advisors. So these users are uh, users who has been exposed to different kinds of experiences who have 
experience at being unemployed who are, who are currently in a good position. So they give us the perspective from the youth side. So in all of our activities, we will consult with the youth and then we will get the reality from the youth side. So we also engage with the youth advisory boards. Uh, all, all these activities directly will help us uh, for the training and placement centers to adopt or adapt a more effective business models. Uh, they can think of a creative solutions in youth job placement. And also from the employer side, uh, they will have uh, that need to go to the training centers or to the placement centers whenever they need a skilled labor. In addition to this, uh, Additional training and placement organizations also will be attracted to this model once they see the value of uh, this approach. In doing so, we also believe that employers will have uh, a better qualified, a better skilled uh, candidates for their job openings or for any open positions they might have. This will increase their productivity. Uh, there is a huge cost in terms of recruitment and sourcing. And then whenever employees don't have the right skill, they, it, it will lead to staff turnover or employee turnover. So employers have been uh, very impressed with the, this kind of approach, the kind of uses they are receiving from these training centers. In addition to this, uh, although there is a good relationship with employers and with training providers currently, we believe it could be better. So we think this approach also could make the employers and the training service providers relationship much stronger, much trusted one. In doing so, at the end, of course, what we expect is for youth and women to be skilled and then to have a jobs. When we say jobs, we expect that to be a decent job with, uh, with an income that is better than before they got that employment. And then we hope for the training uh, providers also to have a better business models, even though when our, their, our partnership with that training center ends, they can have a better scalable a business model. So this is overall our result chain, how we uh, work on, on our workforce development pay for result approach. Going to uh, how the pay for result approach process looks like. So normally we will have an open bids or calls. Uh, we have uh, very specific criteria for what kind of business solutions we are looking for, what kind of business plans we are looking for, and then each business plan should have a strategy or a solution uh, to place a minimum of 2,000 use each. And then uh, we also expect these uh, bidders or candidate, um, potential candidates to apply for the call also to have a good strategy in empowering women, in empowering youth, and also uh, in focusing not only in specific regions, but to have a broader intervention in at least the major uh, cities within Ethiopia. So our contract or partnership will be uh, based on milestone. So uh, every funding or every uh, support from MS4G will be based on every milestone or result they will achieve. So this could be uh, whenever they do enrollment, whenever they do uh, graduation or completion of training, uh, after they do a placement. And also the placement is not our end goal. We expect also uh, each use which is placed to be retained for a minimum of six months. So we will do also a follow up on that. Uh, in doing so, uh, the, we see a benefit. Actually, we're seeing the benefit currently since we already started applying this job, this approach, both on the use and women, on the training institutions and on the employers. So for the use and women, uh, we have seen that they are receiving in-demand training. It's not a training they just attend, it will be based on a demand, it will be uh, based on a baseline assessment conducted with the need from the private sector. In addition to this, uh, the youth and women will start to see the value of a merit-based career path. So they will think of what could be my next step in my career. In terms of the, for the training and the placement centers, uh, they were able to have this direct relationship with the employers, uh, they were able to think of how they can enhance their business models. And then uh, they were able actually to see uh, a high placement rate through this approach. So that has been some of the major uh, benefits from the training centers. And then from the employer side, uh, they have seen uh, the value of having a skilled labor than 
uh, labor which is coming directly uh, through their doors. So I've seen the value of going to the private training centers and then having a skilled level. And then they have seen also uh, a change in their productivity because it will reduce the turnover. And then there is there will be a higher retention. So they have observed these changes. Plus uh, they have this now a trusted relationship with the uh, training and placement providers. When we come to our year one, since USA Catalyze MS4G program is in its first, we just completed our year one uh, program. Uh, we are going for our year two. So on, on our year one, we were able to partner with three uh, training and uh, placement centers. They are all private, uh, private companies with different kinds of business model, different solutions focused on both wage employment and self-employment. So for us, it's, it's been a great lesson to see both aspects of uh, employment types. So in doing so, uh, through these three partnerships in, in one year, we were able to train about 4,242 youth, in which around 48.8% were women. And then from this, we were able to secure jobs for 2,428 youth, in which around 56.24 were women. So this shows for us as a first year, uh, it showed us how uh, the P4R approach has been uh, good, and then we are hoping also to scale up in year two with better solutions, with better business plan. So uh, thank you, Rebecca. Um, over to you. This has been uh, a brief explanation on our uh, workforce development approach. Thank you so over much. You. Thank you so much, Lydia. I know that you spoke recently with Beza Ayalu, the founder and CEO of Bay Singularity, and one of the recipients of an MS4G pay for performance contract. Can you please tell us about B Singularity and how MS4G has strengthened their ability to engage in employer-led training and placement? Yes, so uh, Beza Yellow is a founder of one of the private training and placement centers called B Singularity. So she has been the founder and then has been engaged at uh, recruiting training and then placing uh, C, uh, junior salespersons. So uh, directly from her, her words, uh, actually, first of all, we apologize that Beza could not join us today, but we were able to uh, recently spoke on our uh, impact and then how the Miss Forge intervention has been helping her. So uh, they, the first thing they will do is, of course, uh, they will do recruitments directly from a local uh, government offices, they will take from uh, Tibet and vocational centers. So they, they have a list of uh, candidates looking for a job. And then the first thing they provide is um, an intensive uh, training within their compound. So this is a very hands-on training, not only uh, theoretical training, but also a practical training. We sending them the use to an actual company doing a salesperson activity. So they have this intensive package of trainings they provide for the use. And then she places them with any available jobs she had. Currently from our discussion for, with her, she has around 6,000 full of employers looking for salesperson. So based on her partnerships with this all private sector, she has been training and then deploying the use. Uh, in these uh, private companies. Uh, in doing so also, she was able to, to understand uh, the current market change, to understand how she can contribute to the market system. So for us, that has been a biggest thing in our partnership with B Singularity. Over to you, Kate. Thank you so much, Lydia. Can you tell us how does B Singularity identify potential employers where they will place the trainees? Uh, so uh, they have a, a call center within their uh, organizations. They reach out around 100 clients every day, uh, communicating with them. If they need any salesperson, if there is any open position, and then based on the need from the private sector, uh, they will. Uh, provide them the skilled labor or the trained users from uh, their data or from the pool of job seekers who, are, who they are training for. So these job seekers are mainly coming from different areas. Uh, there are local government offices such as uh, 
society of such as labor and social affairs bureau uh, there are job seekers found in each district within uh, we call them kabale wereda so there are job seekers which are already listed and waiting for somebody to take them so she goes to these centers and then collects all the job seekers who are looking for kind of some kind of job so she brings them and then she provides some training and then she deploys them to the available job openings and then not only these kinds but there are walking job seekers who directly come to, to her compound and then seek for uh, training and placement opportunities so she uses all kinds of approach in order to reach as much as possible uh, the, the job seekers who are unemployed Lydia, from your recent conversation, could you share how employers view working with MS4G finance services from B-Singularity? Uh, yes, so uh, we recently spoke with one of the employers called uh, Zarihun, Mr. Zarihun Kusaha. He's the owner of uh, Fiscom Engineering Policy, which is uh, an import exporter of electromechanical materials. Uh, he, it's also a private company. So they have been uh, able to, to get employees from uh, B-Singularity. And then they have shared us our, their experience. What's the difference through getting employees through B-Singularity or with their previous experience? So the experience they have uh, told us is they have experienced a different kind of approach because they have been using posting advertisements on newspaper, uh, which is very costly, like I said earlier, on the result chain, most of these employers are go going for job posting, looking for newspaper to be posted, using uh, boards located within the city. So for them, it's been a different experience as per Zarihun's explanation. Uh, and then he also said the training, the, especially the intensive five-day training, uh, has been uh, very uh, helpful because they are seeing it in the performance of the youth when they actually come uh, to the work. And then mostly uh, the company also told us, uh, shared us, uh, not only they will uh, expect the singularity to provide them the, tr the trained youth, they will also add additional trainings, uh, just give them background on, on specific works they work, spe especially for them. Everything is related with engineering, so they will tell them uh, or induct them on how the import export work that is done, or how the electromechanical materials are brought to the country, and then how it will be distributed to the customer. So uh, he has been uh, very impressed with the, with the difference from the employees deployed uh, through the P singularity and then through the job posting on newspaper. Over to you, Rebecca. Great. So I think you also recently spoke to a youth who participated in the program. Could you tell us how the MS4G approach of building local capacity to provide demand-led training is empowering Ethiopian youth? Yes, yeah, so um, a few days ago, we had the pleasure of sitting down with one of the youth uh, who has been placed at uh, Mr. F Zarihun's company at Fiscom Engineering. Her name is Marta Zaleka. And then she has been trained at B Singularity. Uh, and then she's currently working as a junior associate, uh, sales associate at Fiscom Engineering. Uh, and then we asked her how the experience was with the training program and then how is the work she's working now or the new position. So she specifically said the importance of the training has been in developing her skills on how to communicate with customers, clients, how to manage their working, her working time, um, the work environment, and then also she has gained uh, so so much experience from the practical training she has received from the singularity. Uh, she she did not have any previous training experiences. This was her first uh, skills training she got from the singularity, and then she also specifically said she is recommending uh, the training from the singularity for her trained uh, who are looking for jobs uh, like Marta. So she said it's been a, a good experience and then she hopes to work in better positions for the future as well. Over to you, Rebecca. Thank you so much, Lydia. 
Um, and if any of our guests here today would like to speak with Lydia after, um, we have one more uh, session on one more case study to go through, and then we'll have breakout rooms at the end where you could ask specific questions to Lydia. So I'm very excited to introduce our final model looking at income sharing agreements. So we're going to hear from Batya Blankers, the co-founder and CEO of Chanson International. She'll walk us through the origin of Chanson International and the key components of income sharing agreements. Then we'll hear from youth, universities, and government actors that have participated in and benefited from income sharing agreements themselves in a panel discussion led by Amit Brar. Once again, please feel free to type your questions in the chat during the session and join one of the income sharing breakout room um, at after this next uh, case study to speak with Batia herself. The Shansen story um, is actually also my story. Um, I'm South African, and when I finished high school, I was not able to continue my education. I did not get a government loan, and I could not afford a regular bank um, student loan. Um, through a series of fortunate events, I ended up working at a call center in Dusseldorf, Germany. And then I heard about a small private university that would accept my South African high, high school certificate. I applied and was accepted, and was then offered a financing contract to cover my education costs. Um, I, it stated that I do not need to worry about interest payments and my current financial situation does not play a role. The contract asked me to share a portion of my income once I had graduated and was earning above the set amount. This is the first time I actually encountered the income share agreement. At that time, many things came together and I thought about the student protests happening in South Africa at the time and the millions of other young African youth that could not access higher education due to financial constraints. I resolved at this moment that I wanted to make the income share agreement an option for more young excluded youth to finance their education. So I spent a couple of years working for my for the organization that financed me um, and they started to scale across Germany. Uh, and then I asked them for some funding to do a feasibility study into African countries. After having spent 18 months understanding how to adapt the model to, Ru to a Rwandan or South African context, we launched Chance and International in 2018. Um, so the way that we work is that we partner with high quality education institutions first. Once they have proven that their graduates move from learning to earning, we then commit to financing students at these organizations. Since 2018, we have financed about 1,300 students at Davis College and Kepler in Rwanda. Um, those are both excellent institutions that really work closely or ensure that the skills that they provide their young people match the labor market need. An income share agreement is very different to a loan, right? Because it doesn't base um, risk on current financial situation. You look at the risk of someone's future potential income. Um, and so by committing to share a portion of their income, um, every we, we're also spreading risk across a whole cohort. Uh, so what essentially happens is that if you have a, a group of students who've graduated from Aquila and um, they're all paying back 10% of their net income for five years. But because everybody earns a different amount, everybody repays a total different amount within that five years. But what happens is that overall, we are able to collect um, what was invested in that cohort. Um, and that is how you spread risk across a group of people and can therefore essentially provide an uncollateralized loan at the beginning of someone's study period. That also ensures that we don't need to ask for interest payments during someone's study period um, yeah, or collateral. Um, there are four important aspects of an income share agreement. The first is the minimum income threshold. This ensures that you only ask a graduate to repay once they're earning above a certain amount. It essentially removes the risk um, of being over indebted or um, having to pay back a loan um, when you have a very low income. Right? So actually, this, this an income share agreement has no risk to an individual because if they are never employed or if they never earn above the minimum income threshold, they never repay. That's the first feature. The second is capping it. Because people are sharing a portion of their income, you might have very high earners who would um, then repay, um, yeah, could pay five to six times more than what was initially invested in them. But you have to cap this to be fair. And we do this in line with market interest rates as well as inflation. Then the other two important features is the, the repayment percentage. So what is the percentage of someone's income that is repaid? 
And this is an, um, a unique figure that comes from our algorithm. And that goes hand in hand with the repayment period. Um, the repayment period ensures um, or tells the student for how many, for what period do they need to make installments uh, for them to complete their commitment to Shansen. Um, finally, what's vital in our model is that we are building the Shansen community. This is a solidarity based funding model and every student we finance joins the Shansen community and will be a part of an alumni and a network that will grow over years and years where they will support each other in growing in their careers. Um, my name is Amit Brar. I lead this activity called the Catalyze Edu Finance uh, activity here at Palladium. Um, it's a USAID funded activity uh, focusing on improving education outcomes uh, for children of all ages from the very young all the way till the adults, the adolescents who are youth, who uh, some of you uh, are seeing more in your work uh, in Rwanda. Um, the idea behind Catalyze Edu Finance is to promote more private sector investment. And by private sector investment, we mean investors that um, Chanson and others have been able to bring to the education sector. And there are other examples from other countries um, to supplement the uh, largest investor and funder of education globally, which is the local governments. So the governments fund the education, but the demand for education is much larger. And that's where the private sector comes in to fill some of the gap, uh, bring some of the innovations that meet the market needs. And um, in the course of our activity, we have um, covered seven countries in Africa, including Rwanda, and uh, five countries in Latin America. So in Rwanda, when we had uh, begun our search, um, we were looking at all the different uh, age groups uh, for uh, private sector, financing for innovative uh, financing. And uh, we were very uh, impressed and we were very um, privileged to, to discover the example of Chanson, uh, a very unique and very innovative example. And so now Catalyze Edu Finance has an activity where we are partnering with Chanson in Rwanda. It's early days. Uh, we are eager to get started and, and learn from you all uh, at Chanson. And um, uh, we are very happy that we were able to make this connection with Chanson. So um, that's, a, that's a bit about you know, Catalyze. It's a bit about Palladium and, and what we do. Um, but I am uh, keen to you know, pass this over to uh, Bhatia to tell us a little bit about Chanson and how she, her, her journey in, in Chanson began. Thank you so much, Amit. Um, it's great to be here today. So I'm Batya Blankas. I'm the co-founder and the CEO of Chanson International. We, we are very grateful to have an, our established headquarters now in Rwanda, um, and we are growing to serve 10,000 students over the next three years. Um, with the support of the Edu Finance um, activity, we will also be accessing stu students um, who will attend TVET schools. So that is the technical vocational training sector. Um, that's a little bit about me. I'm really excited to be here and thank you everyone for joining. Excellent, uh, Bhatia. Thank you for that introduction. Also, I should have uh, started by congratulating uh, you all, Chanson, uh, with your deal with the DFC that just recently got announced. That is a, a huge um, a validation and a huge endorsement of uh, everything that Chanson is able to achieve so far and uh, uh, is, is uh, projecting for their future in, in Africa. So congratulations for that. Thank you. Um, and then, you know, who better to ask about the product than another user? So um, Mary Grace, I understand you were at Akila, you were a recipient of ISA, and could you speak a little bit about 
um, what were your thoughts about how to finance your education? What were the options you were looking at? Why you went with the chance in ISA and, and, and how it helped? Thank you. I'm Marie Grace Chigny. I'm a community uh, member from Shansen. I was graduated in Akila Davis College. So I joined the community of Shansen in 2018 when that was sponsored. It was um, a life saving to me because by that time when I joined, I was coming from another university and my parents, one of my parents was coming out of the surgery. So he had to go into the at a process of like uh, recovery. So he, he got a stroke. So we couldn't afford the university, me and my twin sister, which were both the, the members of community of Chansen. So it was a life saver to us. We joined the Aquila and then we say, oh, Chansen is there to help us make sure we graduate. And then yes, make sure and go to the field we start our career and then pay back when we finish. So it was um, a really great opportunity for us to learn and to grow. So um, I really thank Chansen and I will pay back. <laughs> That's lovely, Mary Grace. Uh, I should have started by congratulating you on your graduation. So well done. Thank you. Um, when you, Gloria, I'm looking at you and when you hear stories like Mary Grace, I'm sure there are many other students that go through the hallways of Kepler. You've been there from the very beginning of this ISA activity. Uh, can you speak a little bit about your partnership with Chanson and, 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 how, many and how many Mary Graces have you seen graduating from, uh, from your institution that have been helped by ISAs? And, and tell us a little bit about how this partnership has, um, has, has worked for you all at uh, Kepler. Thank you so much. My name is uh, Gloria Mukunzi. I am uh, the uh, Associate Director for Student Lending at Kepler. So um, we, we, we work with students like uh, Mary Grace and Batya who come to join us um, at Kepler. Um, it's very interesting because when uh, we started, we were wondering when we started offering ISA, we were wondering how many students would be interested. But so far, it has been consistent. 90% of our student body um, are interested in ISA. Um, so, uh, as you can see, this, these students, if we didn't have something like ISA to offer them, they won't be able to um, access to uh, higher education. So um, for, for us as an institution, it was a game changer because we, are, we want to help. We want to offer that good education uh, to, to students and also um, help them when they graduate. Uh, we assist them to, when they graduate to have access to jobs. But as an organization, how are we going to be able to sustain ourselves in the wrong run uh, so that we, we keep uh, helping even uh, future cohorts. So with uh, partnering with uh, Chanson through the income share agreement, it was really good because it was a way for us to be able to have those funds coming in. We do our work, then uh, Chanson has taken a, 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 like a burden to finance our, our students while we do uh, our work. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that, uh, Gloria. Um, DG Faustin, you, you are in the, uh, in the ministry, you're, you're working with the government. You are hearing today from the private sector examples of finance, of uh, education institution like Kepler and, and graduates like Mary Grace. But I'm curious from where you are in the in the government, what does all this mean uh, for the economy in Rwanda and how do you see the role of uh, private sector in, in education in Rwanda? 
Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I wish first of all to commend the, the efforts of uh, both Akila, both Chancellor International for the great job. Even before uh, before I go to the, uh, what they're doing, I want also to tell you that I have the background in education. I've been a teacher, both university teacher, so I know what the, uh, what is needed and how the how how education sector is linked to the, to the development globally. Specifically to our country, uh, educational financing has been a big challenge. But again, there are some very good interventions uh, aiming at the tiny place like Shansen, like Akila, who are really doing a great job to allow people from even poor families who could not afford to go through the right education. I, I say the right education because it is very important. If you allow, I may quote uh, Nelson Mandela, let Nelson Mandela said, the biggest weapon to fight against poverty is education. But now it is no longer education alone. It is the right education. So the right education, it is the one that uh, Marie Grass Shimwe has gone through and for other, 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 uh, other classmates who, who are sure that they are getting what they should, they should be getting and what are needed to the labor market. So education financing is very important, but I think, yes, we need the, uh, the support from partners like Shansen and others, but we also need the role of the private sector. Why? Because the private sector is the main consumer, the main beneficiary of education. As in our local context, over 94% of employers are in the private sector. So you understand that the role of private sector is vital to promoting the right education. The right education for me is the one that respond to the private sector and the labor market needs. So how? Uh, maybe uh, I need to give uh, the call to the practitioners like Gloria who are there, but the thing is before even uh, starting to provide education, you need to ask the beneficiary of education. Those are the demand side, what is really needed. If you, uh, I may say, uh, I was reading last week that uh, one book that in the next 20 years, 60% of current jobs will disappear. So that means in the next 20 years, 60% of the workforce today, if they don't change the way they work, if the education does not align, those people are going to lose jobs. So it is very important to say that the Education of financing is very important, but also it should not be just for financing. I should be looking at what, what are the right skills that are needed today and tomorrow. Because for me, there are like three or four questions we should be asking ourselves while financing education for our, our financing to be meaningful. One, what will be the skills needed in the future? Let's say maybe in those, those 20 years to come. What will be the skills needed? What will be the demand on the labor market? How will the skills change over time? And again, how will artificial intelligence and other technologies change the way we work, we think today? So those are the things that will be, and where, where will jobs come from? Because the sectors are changing over time. If you look at 20 years back, the sectors have been changing, the employment sectors. So while we think of financing education, it is very important to look at the dynamics, be it on labor market, maybe I have been talking too much, but indeed no, no. we need to see the relevance of the financing yeah. is very key. To know whether Absolutely. what we are financing will be relevant in the future. Of Absolutely, no, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, DG Faustin, I think you're absolutely right that the education that we are providing has to be relevant to the job market or else we are going to create a lot of unemployed graduates. And there is no, there is no benefit to the society of all the education if at the end of it, you are not getting employment. DG Faustin, you are, you are, you are hearing all these stories. I hope uh, 
it it, uh, it also uh, you know encourages uh, the government to to think more about you know what other so we can have more keplers and more aquilas and we can have more graduates like mary grace and bernardine in in rwanda and uh, you know right now we are not traveling so much but i hope when our, when travel begins and we are able to visit kigali that we can meet you in person and i would love to uh, sit down with you and discuss uh, more and hear more about your thoughts and ideas for for promoting uh, you know tibet education and youth employment yep Thank you so much. And I, I, I also would like to tell you that there is something we are planning as the ministry to ensure that we are going to rank high learning institutions by labor market absorption or by employment rate. And that's how people are going to know how amazing the institution is doing the job. We really need to do the education that responds to the labor market needs, that is aligned to the labor market needs. And you are doing a great job in this. So I congratulate you, I congratulate Captain International for the big role they are playing towards that. And also I congratulate the initiators of this conversation because I think we need more similar conversations to ensure that we exchange ideas on how we can do better. The right Absolutely. education is the one that is linked to the labor market needs. Full stop. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Yes, well said, well said, and thank you so much. Great. Um, and now we are going to actually move into our breakout question and answer sessions. So up on your screen, you'll see the three rooms, three of the different models that we've discussed today. Um, we have representatives from each of our uh, presentations in those rooms. So I'm going to go ahead and open the rooms. We'll have about 10 minutes to join. Um, you'll see a breakout room icon appear at the bottom uh, menu of your screen, and you can select which room you would like to uh, join. So I'm going to go ahead and open those rooms. We, like I said, we have about 10 minutes. I will be here in the main room if you have questions or uh, trouble moving to your room. And uh, yeah, we'll see you in the rooms. All right. Welcome back, everyone. I think we're just all rejoining from breakout, so we'll get it next up more seconds. As we rejoin, I'm going to go ahead and hand it back over to Rebecca for some closing remarks. Thank you so much. And thank you so much to everyone um, for, for joining us today. So from these three case studies, um, we can really see that they, that to demonstrate, or sorry, <laughs> that these three case studies demonstrate that to catalyze lasting transformations of workforce development systems, it's important to facilitate market system solutions, address the root causes of workforce inefficiency, demonstrate business models that are financially sustainable, and incentivize new sources of co-investment um, to complement existing financing. Um, anywhere that we're working, whether it's Kosovo, Tanzania, El Salvador, Honduras, or anywhere else, it's imperative to facilitate private sector-led solutions that incentivize um, innovative co-investment. So we'd like to invite participants to continue to engage with Caladium in making sense on uh, toward uh, forward, uh, on, sorry, moving forward um, to adapt, adopt, and ex expand these sustainable solutions. So we'll take today's questions and discussions back to the summit team and develop a series of solution rooms to continue to engage with youth practitioners, businesses, and governments to design local solutions and identify tangible action items to take these ideas forward. So please watch your calendars for communications from the summit and making sense on a virtual gathering in January. And thank you all so much. Back over to you, Matthew. Fantastic. Thank you uh, to Katie and you, Rebecca, for moderating such an interesting discussion on these uh, different financing models. Great speakers, practitioners from different parts of the world. It's particularly nice to hear from young people in Guillermo in Ecuador and, and Marie Grace in Rwanda. Um, and also just now providing the opportunity for participants to discuss these models with our, our panelists in the breakout rooms. Um, whether AEI is, as, as a, you know, for me, as an ecosystem actor, convener, seated through USAID funding many years ago, now thriving on its own. It's great to see 
It's exciting to see the MS4G um, success using the pay for performance model, using private sector training providers, making sure young people are at the center and in informing training design as a central part of that model is great. And then finally, you know, chance in a student private sector driven income sharing agreements model uh, in partnership with uh, TVET and education systems. All these are, 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 are great, great models, great ways to, for all of us to think about um, our work moving forward. Um, I want to just take a uh, last minute or two to um, let everyone know this is the last in our series of, of, y of lead YEO solution sessions. Um, please let us or let those know who may not have uh, been able to join all of these sessions. There are past solution sessions as well that the recordings will be posted on our website that you see here on this slide, YEO2030.org. Um, but you can join us for our final associate sessions taking place. Um, there's one on Friday, a couple more earlier next week, and all that is on our website under the uh, events tab, where you can uh, look, see more details and, and, and register. Um, and you can also find certainly more details about the YEO 2030 initiative on our, on our website there. Lastly, um, I want everyone to note that uh, this is just the beginning. YEO 2030 is, uh, has a long-term vision and horizon the scalable solutions shared during um, this webinar. You heard uh, Rebecca talk about at the end um, in all of our webinars over the past couple of months, together with key outcomes from youth dialogues that are, that are also taking place. Those will inform future conversations that we convene as our community of adults and young people strive to hold the, the ecosystem of, of actors in this space accountable to achieve SDG 8. So I urge you to stay tuned for upcoming events coming into 2022. Um, so for, I think that's all, at least, um, on our end, thank you again to all of you for joining, um, enjoy the rest of your, your days, your afternoons, your, your evenings. Bye-bye everyone. Bye. Thank you everyone.